Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's New Year's Eve, and we have a lot of people gone because it's New Year's Eve, but we are here, and uh, we want to wish everybody a Happy New Year, and we're going to tell you later what we're going to do this evening, but uh, first of all, we're here to worship the Lord and to glorify Him. So let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your love. We just pray that you'd be with us this morning. Father, as we come to the end of 2023, as we think about moving into a new year, help us to look to you. Father, we thank you for bringing us through this year. We look forward to a new one. And Father, help us now to live for you, to live for Jesus, to praise him, to glorify him. Be with this worship time together, for it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's start our worship service with a call to worship. 599. Can you say that with me? I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known to all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever. That you establish your faithfulness in heaven itself. Kind of a, a uh, like a rock skipping upon a pond. 
<coughs> and uh, do a few here and a few there. And so we got to a look at some very, very beautiful psalms this morning. Words of encouragement and words of hope. So we would like to invite you to join us. The ladies are meeting now on uh, Thursday mornings in the library at 10.30. And they would love to have you come and join them. And then the guys are getting together also on Thursday mornings at 11 in my office. Uh, the difference being is that I feed these guys. I realize that's the only reason they come, is they come for the food. But uh, anyway, we have a good time with a fellowship. Uh, thank you. The Morris family wishes to thank all of you, our church family, for the gracious, very, very gracious <coughs> that we have received. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh -huh. <laughs> the ramp is taking shape. Um, boy, these Sutherland boys, you get them to let them loose and they start ripping things apart. Well, the old stairs are gone. There are new stairs that are usable. They're not finished, but uh, it is coming along. The uh, electric door is uh, functional, which again is meant for handicapped access. If you have any um, questions about how to use that, Seriously, talk to Mark Sutherland. He'll train you how to use it. It's really, really easy. And uh, eventually we'll have it all done. And once it is all done, we're going to have a rededication ceremony. But again, as you know, we went way above our budget because so much needed to be replaced. This week, when Andy Sutherland was ripping out the old steps, we got to one of the main posts, and it was just swinging in the breeze. It had totally rotted it off. So it's amazing that it never collapsed. Uh, apparently it was built good enough uh, in between. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, a lot needed to be done. So if you would like to give towards that project, please do so. Operation Christmas Child. This is the last Sunday that we're going to donate in the coin jar for the shipping costs of Operation Christmas Child. And so if you have one uh, less offering that you'd like to give to us that, please do so. Then this summer, we're going to start all over again, because this summer we're going to start packing boxes again and uh, getting ready for uh, a New Year's worth of Operation Christmas Child. Virginia Gatfield sent me a link, and if I remember correctly, Operation Christmas Child, Samaritan's Purse, is celebrating the 200 millionth box delivered. 200 million boxes. So that's utterly amazing uh, how the gospel of Jesus Christ is going out throughout the world. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, that's what that's all about. But now, starting next Sunday, our new project for the coin jar is going to be uh, Congregation Beth Israel of Walla Walla. Many of you realize that because of what's going on in the Middle East right now, a huge wave of anti-Semitism has risen. And it's absolutely incredible. It's unbelievable uh, what is coming, especially out of our college and university campuses, some of our cities. We as believers believe that God is bringing back the people of Israel to their land. And that there are Jews around the world that we don't hate. We love them. We eventually love them to come to know their Messiah. But we want to show our support and our encouragement. So two ways you can do that. One is if you're driving down Alder Street and you drive past the synagogue, if you see any funny business going on, please call 911 because they can't be there 24-7. And as you know, there have been many uh, Jewish sites around the world that have been vandalized. And we certainly don't want to see that happen. The other way that we can help is through our coin jar project. We've let them know that we're going to be sending them whatever funds come in, and they can use them as they see fit. I'm just assuming they are probably supporting a number of people in Israel during this period of time. So that's what our no, no, new, I can't even talk, coin jar project. Say that ten times fast. Our new coin jar project is all about. As we pray for the peace of Israel, again, I don't have an update in the bulletin because the news changes so rapidly what is going on. I do know that I listened to the news this morning and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that Israel is not going to call for a ceasefire. 
they are not going to stop. They feel like they need to proceed and finish the job that they've started. Uh, that is very difficult because we know that innocent civilians have been killed in the process and um, a whole area of the country is being destroyed. But again, there is a reason why they're having to do what they're doing. So please be praying for Israel in all of this. As we go on to our own alliance for requests, we have a little video that I want to show you right now. Many of you know that we are a part of the alliance in the United States of America. And Dr. John Stumbo is the president of the alliance in the United States. Okay. But every country around the world where the alliance works has their own individual local church. And so we have something called the Alliance World Fellowship that meets every few years, and we elect a leader to help coordinate alliance work around the world. Well, the president this year of the Alliance World Fellowship gives an end of the year greeting. He is from Brazil, and so that's what his accent is all about. We'd like to listen to his message at this time. Dear brothers and sisters, as we bid farewell to the year 2023, I'm filled with gratitude and joy as we reflect on the remarkable journey we have shared together as a global Alliance family. This year marked a centennial milestone for five national churches, Cambodia, Colombia, Syria, Mali, and Burkina Faso. These centenary churches stand as powerful testaments to the enduring resilience and strength of the Alliance, vividly illustrating how God sustained His church even in the face of formidable challenges, whether it be the rebuilding of the Khmer Evangelical Church in Cambodia following the genocide, the steadfastness of the Alliance Church in Syria after the civil war, or the profound impact of the Alliance Churches in Colombia, Mali, and Burkina Faso, on countless lives through local ministries encompassing churches, schools, and medical centers. His story is a chapter in the grand narrative of our commitment to fulfill the Great Commission. Let's remember our brethren in Ukraine, the Holy Lands, Myanmar, North Africa, as they continue to endure the hardship of war and persecution. Now, more than ever, it's imperative for us to Unite as a global family, offering our support through prayers and every available means. Our regional conferences in France, in Peru, and Liberia were pivotal in promoting missional leadership and cooperation for evangelization and world mission. During our annual meeting of the AWF Global Network of Mission Leaders, we discussed member care steps for effective partnership and more than 30 partnership opportunities using the diaspora and business as platforms for missions. The Alliance World Fellowship took a significant step forward in strengthening the Alliance DNA with the inaugural Alliance Theological Symposiums. Scholars from diverse backgrounds came together to deepen the understanding and the present-day implications of the history and theology of the Alliance movement. Additionally, Alliance DNA seminars were held in various countries, offering pastors, missionaries, and church leaders an opportunity to reflect on how the spiritual heritage of a movement can serve as a key to unlocking solutions to the challenges confronting us today. Our commitment to missions remains resolute, as underscored by the compelling story we had the privilege to share from around the globe. Yet, we are fully aware that there exist countless more inspiring testimonies that shine a light on the transformative power of the unwavering faith and dedication exhibited by our missionaries serving across six continents of the world. I encourage you to share your story to the Global Alliance family through the AWF communication channels. During 2023, the AWF supported a transformative four-day training organized by Alliance Churches in 10 African countries 
in collaboration with Echo West Africa. More than 500 enthusiastic community members and testers were trained in farming lottery, microcredit management, and other farming and poultry techniques. The community members that train sessions equipped with newfound knowledge determined to implement these sustainable techniques and share their learnings with the wider community. These initiatives in Africa, along with the Asia Pacific Region Renewal and Development Conference held in Indonesia, highlighted our commitment to holistic development and environmental sustainability. The AWF Women's Ministry has been a beacon of encouragement and empowerment throughout the year. Online gathering, prayer events, and celebrations have united Alliance Women worldwide fostering spiritual growth, family relationship, and the use of spiritual gifts. As we stand on the threshold of a new year, let's carry forward the lessons and blessings of 2023. May the bonds we forged, the challenges we overcome, and the victory we celebrated serve as catalysts for an even more impactful year ahead. United as the Alliance family, our collective calling is to guide the way for the future generation diligently engaging in evangelism, discipleship, and proclamation of Jesus Christ to all nations. We wish you and your loved ones a Merry Christmas and a blessed New Year. We are Alliance. I have some facts for you. First of all, if you looked at him, you might say, he doesn't look Brazilian. Did you know that his ethnicity is Japanese? His parents moved from Japan to Brazil. He was born there. He speaks Portuguese. He delivered this in English. The other thing is, did you know that there is a greater part of the alliance around the world than there is in the United States? In fact, I have a question for you. Of all the nations around the world, which nation has the biggest alliance church? Indonesia. Indonesia has the largest local alliance church, which is very interesting. So, we are part of a worldwide family that is trying to reach out and put the gospel together. So, please be praying uh, for all of our alliance uh, international workers, realizing that we are not the only country that sends out international workers. Many other alliance countries send out workers as well. And so, let's be praying. Father God, we thank you for your love, and Father, we thank you for Operation Christmas Child. We thank you for this um, milestone, 200 million shoeboxes delivered. Father, we thank you for our own coin jar project, and Father, we just pray that you would bless the funds that we send uh, in a way that this will help more of these boxes to be sent. Father, we also pray for Congregation Beth Israel of all the law. And again, especially for the nation of Israel right now. Father, we realize that it's not just a nation that's under attack. It's an entire group of people. And Father, we condemn anti-Semitism. And Father, help us as believers to stand up with Jewish people around the world. And show them the love of their Messiah. And then Father, we would pray for the Alliance World Fellowship. We thank you for the partnership with all these different alliance national groups coming together for the purpose of spreading the gospel. Father, bless each and every ministry. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. All right, we are going to sing right now, and Debbie does not know this song, so I'm going to lead you. I realize that's dangerous. <laughs> but I'm going to try. It's number 237, or the words are on the screen. You may be rather surprised um, if you take a look in your hymn book. It actually gives the author, and this was written by Dottie Rambo. And you might not think of Dottie Rambo as a Christian uh, writer, but uh, she is or was a believer, and uh, she wrote this. And so we're going to say both verses of We Shall Behold Him.
thank you for helping me out. Because again, I gotta be honest with you, it's always been hard for me to stick with the program and to get it done every day. But since I knew that there were gonna be those of you who would be texting me at seven o'clock in the morning with deep theological questions about what I just read, I had to be ready. So every night, the night before, I would do the reading, got all the way through. And so uh, anyway, if you did do your reading for today, again, we finished. And uh, we were in Malachi chapters 3 and 4, uh, Proverbs 31, verses 18 through 31, and Revelation 21 and 22. And uh, as I always do, I put some little notes in for each day. And uh, again, when it came to Malachi 3 and 4, there's the talk about the great day of the Lord. And we look forward to that. Uh, when it came to Proverbs chapter 31, I just note uh, that I wrote down was a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. And again, uh, this is uh, a tribute to a righteous woman, a righteous wife and mother, and, and how the Lord can use her. But then when it came to Revelation chapter 21 and 22, I just simply put, a new heaven and a new earth. I know you've heard this old adage before, but I'm going to give it to you again. I read the end of the book, and guess what? We win. <laughs> The key verse for today was Revelation 21, 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And how appropriate that is today, even in our own midst, as we pray for the Hare family. The thought is God will wipe away every tear from your eye with the very hands that are scarred by the nails that were driven in the cross for your sins. Death will be vanquished for all eternity and slowly forgotten as we live in blissful praise of our God who conquered it for us. There will be no place for crying, sorrow, or pain as all things will finally be made right. Could there be a more hopeful vision to hold on to in this life? Your struggles, pain, and tears are ephemeral and like a vapor that will be quickly forgotten in the all-encompassing light of God's glory. Come, Lord Jesus, and make his future our present reality. So what a neat way to end the year. Now, put the next slide up. Um, I think there's still four books back there. And three books. Now there's three books. Uh, if you did not get one of the reading guides for this coming year, please grab one. I think we've given people plenty of opportunity. We've passed out a lot of them. You can still order one of your own. But as a result, we are not going to be putting sheets in the bulletin this coming year with the readings, because most of you have them. And I'm also not going to be posting every day, 365 days this last year, I've been putting the daily reading on in case somebody didn't get it on Facebook. So I'm not going to be doing that, because you, you've got it. And so again, this reading guide is, is developed very, very similarly to this one. The only thing that I've noticed is that instead of there being a short key verse to read, uh, it lists some verses to read, and then it has a devotional thought. But right across the top, it has the reading again for every day, uh, and it's divided into three sections, Old Testament, uh, the book of Psalms or Proverbs, and New Testament, and then there's other areas for you to write different notes and things like that. So they're a neat little guide. They have a little elastic where you can mark the day of the, the week. I hate this thing. I want to rip it off because it ties into knots. It never works for me. So I have added my own little bookmark every day. Okay? So you don't have to use this Alaska. Cut it off. If you like it, it's there. All right, let's move on to our study in the book of Matthew. And uh, Vicki, you can go one more slide there. Thank you for Vicki. Uh, because she is uh, filling in for Steve Lesur. They're out of town for the New Year's. Anyway, we're going to talk about the demand for a sign in Matthew 16, verses 1. If you ever talk to somebody, and you witness to them, and they have said to you, if only, you know, if only God would do this for me. If only God would answer this prayer request. If only God would do this miracle. Well, then I might trust him. Then I might believe in him. 
that's the way we are. We're, we're looking for some sort of sign, some sort of evidence that, that, that God is really going to do this. You know, I just assume that there are some people who expect to hear a knock at the door, and they open the door, and there is this angel who has descended from heaven riding a camel, and he hands to them a golden scroll to read, you know. Well, that's not the way God operates. And in Jesus' day, he had performed all sorts of signs. Think about it. He had raised the dead. He had cast demons out of people. He had healed people. One time he fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. Another time he fed 4,000 people. He had done all of these miracles, all these signs, and yet the Jewish religious leaders come to him and say, show us a sign. So we're going to take a look at that. Our key verse this morning is in Matthew chapter 16, verse 4, where it says this. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. The point that we want to make this morning is this. There is no greater sign of Jesus' Messiahship than his death, burial, and resurrection. That's it. So the question that I need to ask myself is, do I demand signs from God? Do I, I keep going to the Lord and saying, Lord, if you, if you really love me, would you just do this? Prove it. You know, show me this, show me that, or whatever. Well, Jesus is saying to these religious leaders, ultimately, you're only going to get one side. And if you don't believe in it, I guess you don't believe. So we're going to talk about two things this morning. A sign from heaven and a sign of Jonah. First of all, the sign, a sign from heaven. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, it says this. The Pharisees and Sadducees came and, testing him, asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Now, folks, I want to let you know that a miracle had just taken place. Okay? You might not realize it, but what if I, I put it in this way? The Democrats and Republicans came together and asked a politician to do something for them. Okay? You'd say, that'll never happen. The Democrats and the Republicans will never come together. Well, we're talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay? Their working together showed a deep fear among the religious leaders. The Sadducees and Pharisees were long-standing enemies. And the fact that they came together against Jesus shows they regarded him as a serious threat. In fact, the Pharisees lived according to the smallest points of the oral and scribal law. The Sadducees received only the written words of the Hebrew Scriptures. The Pharisees believed in angels and the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. Therefore, they were sad, you see. The Pharisees were not a political party and were prepared to live under any government that would leave them alone to practice their religion the way they wanted to. The Sadducees were aristocrats and collaborated with the Romans to keep their wealth and power. The Pharisees looked for and longed for the Messiah. The Sadducees did not. So this is a miracle in and of itself. Jesus has actually united these two groups of people. It's kind of like if you go over to the Middle East today, all Muslims are not alike. There's Sunni Muslims and Shiite Muslims, and they hate one another. They want to destroy one another. The only thing they hate worse is the nation of Israel and the United States. So if they were ever to be able to destroy Israel and the United States, then they would go back to work at destroying one another. Okay? They're Muslims, but different Muslims. So you have the Pharisees and you have the Sadducees who hate one another, but apparently they hate Jesus worse. They want to get rid of Jesus, so it has brought them together. Now I want you to think about something. Jesus had done many signs and they remained convinced. They looked for a sign from heaven such as 
calling down fire from heaven, preferably against a Roman legion. They said they were not convinced by the signs on earth Jesus had already done. So you understand what's going on here? You know, he had, like I say, fed 4,000, fed 5,000, healed people, cast out demons, raised the dead, but that's all material. That's all earthly, you know. Maybe, maybe you did this by the slide of the hand. You know, this is some sort of a magic trick. We want real proof. Now remember Elijah? <coughs> the prophets of Baal? Mount Carmel? How did God prove that who he really was? Fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. We want a sign from heaven. Oh, really? The immediate demand of the Jewish leaders for a sign from heaven contrasts sharply with the Gentile crowd's response to Jesus' miracles. You understand the point there? These Gentiles who did not have the word, many of them were believing. We've seen the Syrophoenician woman, you know. We've seen the Cornelius. Well, that's in the future. We've seen the, the, uh, the uh, Roman centurion. These are Gentiles who have faith. And yet these Jewish leaders, they want more. Well, he answered them in verse 2. When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and overcast. Oh, you hypocrites, you discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. When I was a kid, I learned an expression. Red at night, sailors delight. Red in the morning, sailors take warning. Okay? And again, that pretty much it, it comes to the case. You know, a lot of us can walk outside, you look at the weather, you figure out what it's going to do. When I was a young man, I was told by old people that they could predict the weather by their joints. I thought, oh, no, you can't do that. Guess what? You can. Yeah. All right. Because you can feel it in your joints, in your bones. So here we go through life, and you can predict a lot of things just by observing what is going on around you? Jesus said to these religious leaders, these are the Pharisees, these are the Sadducees, these aren't just common people. These are the religious leaders. He calls them hypocrites because they can tell the weather, but Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, stands in front of them and does all these things and they can't understand the signs. All right. So, Let's take a look now at a sign, the sign of Jonah. We've seen a sign from heaven, now the sign of Jonah. Verse 4. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign shall be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So he left them and departed. This statement of Jesus reminds us that signs alone convert no one. It is easy to place far too much confidence in signs and wonders as tools to bring people to faith in Jesus. Again, you turn on your television, you have all these televangelists who are, who are saying that they can perform all these miracles. You know, they can save all these people. Yet miracles in and of themselves don't save people. Okay? It's a person's faith in Jesus or his accomplished work on the cross that saves somebody. So, Jesus promised a sign that would have power to bring people to faith. What was that? His resurrection. He had previously mentioned the sign of the prophet Jonah in Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 through 41, clearly explaining it as his coming resurrection. So let's go back and take a look at that in Matthew chapter 12, starting with verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up, 
at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one that is greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and will condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And now one greater than Solomon is here. Some of you have heard of Lee Strobel. Some of you have read his books, The Case for Christ, The Case for Miracles, you know, several different books like that. He was an atheist. He was a reporter for a major Chicago newspaper. He covered court trials. So he was an expert on evidence. His wife became a believer. He thought, oh my goodness, I don't want this in my house. I'm going to spend one weekend and I'm going to prove to her that Christianity is false and then we can go on with our lives. So he figured, what is the linchpin? And in his mind, the linchpin was the resurrection of Jesus. If he could prove to her that Jesus never rose from the dead, then they could go back to life as normal. Two years later, he's sitting at his desk with piles of evidence in front of him. And he realizes he's got to make a decision. And all of the evidence pointed to the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he became a believer. That's the sign that Jesus said. Now, we can remember some of the similarities between Jonah and Jesus. Jonah sacrificed himself that others would be saved. Jonah disappeared from all human view in doing this. Jonah was sustained the days when he could not be seen. Jonah came back after three days as back from the dead. Jonah preached repentance. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1, we find the Apostle Paul giving us the definition of the gospel. What is the gospel? Now, brothers, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you have received, in which you stand. Through it you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, was buried, rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve. And he was seen by over five hundred brothers at once, of whom the greater part remain to this time, though some have passed away. Then he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. Last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born at the wrong time. J. Warner Wallace, you've heard me refer to him a number of times, went back and tried to figure out whether or not there was actually eyewitness testimony regarding Jesus' life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. As he was trying to uncover all of these things, he found out that this that Paul was stating was something that Christians had memorized. They may have actually sung it, kind of like a Christian hymn. And so in 1 Corinthians, which is written in the 50s or 60s, after, after uh, a, you know, A.D., so about 20 to 30 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Paul is writing these things to a church in Corinth. And he says that what I told you is what was given to me. So he went back and tried to figure out, when was this given to him? Well, Paul became a believer within just a few years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he visited the apostles. And apparently, they delivered to him this phrase, this saying, this quote, this song that was already being used amongst believers within just a few years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So don't let anybody come along and say to you, well, Jesus was just a good man, he was just a good teacher, and, you know, a few hundred years later, they just kind of embellished and embellished the story. No. From the very, very beginning, the message of the church was that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived, he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again. And Jesus, as he's looking at these religious leaders, they're saying, well, give us some sign. Give us some sign from heaven. 
He said, well, no sign is going to be given to you. You're an adulterous generation. But by the way, those were not words of compliment. Okay. He was not trying to, to flatter them when he said things like that. He said, there will be no sign other than my resurrection. That is the sign of Jonah. How did Jesus rise from the dead? God, the Father, did something miraculous. He invaded human history. But why do we consider the resurrection a miracle? I was listening again to John Lennox last night in this big presentation that he was making. He said, we call something a miracle when it's not what normally happens. We say that it violates the laws of nature. So normally, people who have died don't come back to life. They stay dead. So if somebody is dead, we've seen them killed, executed on the cross. We've seen them buried. If they come back to life, that is a miracle. And it's a miracle because God, from heaven, came down and invaded human history and did something different. It's a miracle. And that is the greatest sign that was ever been given. All right, so we have a sign from heaven, the sign of Jonah. Now, I went and I got online and I took a look at a message by Dr. David Reagan. Because, you know, we have something today going on in our midst that ought to alert people. And I want to put a list on the screen. These are signs regarding Jesus' second coming or to say that we are living in the end times. What are those signs? You know, as we talk to people, we ought to be able to relate to them. The time is growing short. I was driving down the street the other day and uh, listening to a song on Enlighten, the Sirius Satellite Christian radio station. And basically the song was saying that it's 11.59 and Jesus is coming at midnight. The time is growing short. We don't have time to go into all of the details. So I'm just going to list these, these signs that David Reagan says that we should be paying attention to as we share with others. First of all, there are the signs of nature. Uh, in Luke 21, 11, Jesus said there will be great earthquakes in various places, plagues and famines. There will be terrors and great signs from the heaven. Well, a lot of people say, well, that. What's new about that? We've always had earthquakes. We've always had plagues or things. But Jesus in Matthew 24, 8 said that these were like birth pangs. Now, I have never been pregnant. I have never delivered a child. But I have watched my wife four times deliver a child. And I realized that contractions, birth pangs, get worse. They get stronger before the baby's born. And uh, David Reagan looked up some statistics between October 1991 and November 2004. It's a period of 13 years. Now that's past. This is before Hurricane Katrina. But even during that period of time, the United States had experienced nine of the 10 largest insurance natural disasters in history, nine of the 10 greatest disasters as ranked by FEMA, five of the costliest hurricanes in history, and three uh, of its four largest tornado swarms in history. That was back in 2004. And think of what has happened since. It is increasing. He talks about the signs of society. And Jesus said, in, or Paul said in Matthew, and in 2 Timothy chapter 3, realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, irreconcilable, malicious gossip, gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Have you turned on the news recently and taken a look at our woke society? Is this not a definition of our society? He talks about spiritual signs. Spiritual signs. In 2 Timothy 4, the time will come when they, professing Christians, will not endure a sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, 
and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. If you haven't taken a look at what is coming out from a lot of Christian groups today, you're not paying attention. There's a side of world politics. Matthew 24, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of war, where nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And again, we could just go on down the list of all the wars that are taking place today. There's the science of technology. Men will faint from fear over the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Think about it. I'm a rather young guy. And yet when I was in school, think of the devices that our kids use in school today. Not only did we not have those devices, they hadn't even been invented yet. Technology is, is increasing at an exponential rate. It's unbelievable. If you go out and you buy a brand new computer, by the time you get it home, it's actually out of date. Okay? Same with the cell phone. They're, they're, they're incredible. Finally, the signs of Israel. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3. And it shall come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured. And all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Go home and turn on the news and see what is going on in Israel today with their neighbors, both Hamas and Hezbollah, with Iran, the pressure from Russia, the pressure from the United Nations. Even the United States is trying to put pressure on Israel right now to, to stop this, to call a ceasefire. The whole world is focusing its attention on Israel right now. So, there are a lot of signs that we are in the last days, that we are in the end times. Remember what our key verse is, though? Matthew chapter 16, verse 4. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign shall be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So again, the point is this. There is no greater sign of Jesus' Messiahship than his death, burial, and resurrection. We can share that with people, and we can share it confidently. The question is, do I demand signs from God? Unfortunately, the world today, from what I understand, you know, atheism used to be growing. I just watched a video last night that says atheism is declining. People now are starting to believe that there is a God or gods. But just because they believe that there may be a God doesn't mean they believe in Jesus. And a lot of them are looking for some sort of sign, some sort of evidence. Well, we can share that with them. We have good news. And the good news is because Jesus rose from the dead, he put an end to death. And again, if you read your Bible reading for today, Revelation chapter 21, 22, we look forward to a time that is yet to come when death will be put away with. Finally, once and for all. Father God, we thank you for your love and we just thank you for your word. And Father, may we be encouraged with passages of scripture like this. Father, unfortunately, we're all too human. We're all looking for some sort of evidence that you really love us. But Father, we thank you for the greatest evidence of all, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. For it's in his name we ask these things.
Thank you. 